Well, hello, and thank you for joining me for another Alex on Tech and ITY TV video interview. I'm joined today by Ben Dyer. He's the technical director and the chief systems architect of Taguchi Marketing. Welcome to the program. Thanks, Alex. It's good to be on. It's great to have you here. Now, Ben, anyone visiting the Taguchi site can see that you're an Australian company with a world-beating marketing automation system with huge Australian and global brands as customers. Uh, but I always like to start at the beginning. Now, this is a slightly long-winded question, but give me a sec. Uh, basically, can you please tell us what marketing automation is as we approach 2022 and how this is different to the typical marketing that people might think of with TV, radio, print and online ads, and of course, all those PR stunts that uh, the PR world is famous for. Yep. So so marketing is a really interesting field. And, and one of the things I do very well is is uh, sort of market their own terms. So I guess marketing automation is uh, it's sort of a new way of expressing a whole bunch of ideas that have been kicking around for a while. Um, but the, the automation comes in. Uh, and I think gives uh, powerful new capabilities uh, to those old ideas. So when we're talking about marketing automation, uh, mostly we're talking about automating the execution, uh, targeting delivery of messages to individual recipients. So unlike, a, say, a TV ad where you're producing one spot, it goes out to a million people or however many people are watching the program, uh, and it's the same message for everyone at the same time. Yeah. Marketing automation enables you to execute individualized messages. So it's it's one message to one specific person at one specific time. Uh, so that's, that's really powerful. Uh, and in a lot of ways, I think it bridges the gap between sales and marketing. So sales, it's kind of a, you know, it's a one-to-one, -one, it's dialogue. Um, it's the salesperson finding out what the customer needs and, and having that give and take. Uh, traditional marketing, obviously, is, you know, here's the message, we're pushing it out, it's going to everyone. Automated marketing uh, of the sort that's possible now uh, is sort of in between. Uh, you know, you're, you're coming up with, you might think of them as like prototype conversations to have with your, with your marketing prospects. And uh, the systems that you put in place will enable those conversations to happen over time at scale. Uh, based on particular responses or signals that you're getting from from your customers. Yeah, I mean, it's a whole series of targeted bullseye type conversations as opposed to the scattergun approach of marketing. And one of the things that you have, you've got your platform as a, a wide range of solutions. You've got performance and security. You've got database management, reporting, membership, loyalty, you know, e-commerce, uh, franchising. You know, it sounds like a very mature platform that accommodates all of the 21st century realities of modern uh, advertising and marketing. So, you know, what else should we know about Taguchi? So, obviously, the uh, this privacy and security stuff these days is it's table stakes. Um, mm -hmm. Everyone has to do it. It's it's incredibly important. And if you lose the trust of your customers because of privacy or security issues, whether that's not honouring opt out requests or, or whether it's you know all the way up to data breaches, etc. If you lose that trust, you're you're going nowhere. Mm. So that's critically important, and we put a huge amount of emphasis on it internally, uh, as well as you know dealing with things like data sovereignty requirements, uh, onshore hosting of data, etc. So uh, obviously, for our for our finance customers, that sort of stuff is especially important. Uh, but everyone is waking up to this, uh, and everyone needs to do better. You know, as an industry, we need to do a whole lot better on the privacy and and security front. Uh, and that's kind of a bit of an alien concept for many marketers, but it, it's something that uh, they'll be dragged to kicking and screaming, uh, I think. And the yeah. ones who get there first are going to be uh, in a much better position as a result of that. Uh, so I guess our platform philosophy, uh, we probably differ from uh, some of the major players in that uh, we have this idea of, I guess, a, a sort of a T-shaped platform. So we have a wide breadth of capability uh, across a number of different uh, a number of different areas, um, so you know CRM reporting that sort of stuff. Uh, but where we're really really focused, where the the kind of stem of the T, the real depth of the functionality, is in that I guess classic marketing automation. Uh, it's the execution personalization of content on mass. Uh, so what our platform does, uh, in my view, probably better than anybody else, where we really hang a hat, is being able to automate content production 
automate targeting, automate segmentation, and actually deliver on the promise of you know getting the right message to the right person at the right time. Uh, whereas we we see a lot of the uh, the major platforms, you know, it's a series of boxes to check. They want to check all the boxes, uh, but there isn't necessarily any best of breed functionality in there. Mm -hmm. uh, and in in the current marketplace, uh, we're sort of seeing among our clients a move more towards uh, infrastructure as a service type platforms. So yeah, mm -hmm. Amazon AWS, yeah, Microsoft Azure, etc. Uh, those are obviously extremely mature, extremely scalable and commodity priced. Uh, and as they sort of move up the tech stack, uh, we're finding a lot of the, uh, you know, the data flow stuff, data management uh, storage is moving there uh, outside of, you know, potentially the traditional marketing cloud type systems. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so as a platform, we really need to have a, a differentiator uh, that, you know, would be a reason why you would use Taguchi over uh, you know, hooking everything up in AWS with, uh, you know, RDS and some Lambda functions to trigger off emails, uh, which, you know, everyone can do. So, yeah, that that's uh, being able to personalize and execute at scale. That's our, our bread and butter. That's where we really focus. And uh, because we are sort of focused on delivering really deep capability uh, in that space, uh, we also prioritize integration. Uh, so being able to integrate with with everything through from you know legacy legacy systems uh, to AWS to uh, newer providers like Snowflake for for data management, we integrate really well and we play re really well uh, in a sort of a an environment where you have a bunch of best of breed solutions hooked together. Yeah. So I guess that's our, that's our kind of view of the future. That's where we we think people are going to go, and and that's what we're targeting. Well, it's always nice to play well with others, and and this, in this modern world, you have to do that. Um, I was also just thinking that you know when Facebook said the future is privacy, everybody laughed. But when Apple uh, did things like um, make it uh, difficult, well, they removed the ability of the mail program to sort of send back the uh, uh, the trackers and and uh, to, yeah. to block them and yeah. to to block the um, mail sender from knowing that you've opened the email or your location. So, do any of those uh, moves and changes have any impact on you? And and how do you get around them if they do? Yeah, there, there was uh, yeah, a, it, it's a really good example that one actually, because there was there was sort of a bit of a panic in the industry um, earlier on, and you know possibly justifiably so for for a lot of companies and a lot of marketers because they do rely on those metrics. Mm. Uh, with Taguchi, you know, almost going going back to the marketing automation uh, questions at the start, and and the idea of you know fifty percent of the ad spend being wasted mm. in traditional media, the problem is that you don't have enough data. Uh, you know, you, you screen your, your TV spot and did anyone watch it? Well, you got Nielsen, you can kind of do a proxy, but really? Uh, and, you know, how much how much impact did that one TV spot have? Uh, well, I guess if you kept on doing it, you could probably infer over time if your sales were growing that it might have had something to do with it, but who knows? The problem with digital is the opposite. There are so many metrics, there is so much data that working out what to look at, you know, what's important uh, becomes a really major issue. And a lot of companies uh, kind of get uh, sidetracked on, on metrics that aren't necessarily true reflections of their performance. Uh, and so they, they start optimizing for the wrong things, which can be pretty dangerous. With Taguchi, we are really focused on providing people with actionable information, you know, the data that matters. And so among our clients, we really push for uh, integration of transaction data, conversion data, you know, on-site behavior, uh, all the way back so that we can track, okay, somebody has received an email, then they go on the website, then they buy the product. Uh, so when you have that level of data, whether or not they, you know, opened the email, which has always been a, a, a pretty rough proxy for them reading it, mm. um, it's not that important. It's kind of a, uh, you know, it's a metric that is nice to have uh, if you see anomalies uh, in your overall conversion performance from those communications, but it's it's not the be all, be all and end all. And I think having it widely known that these things are, you know, opens and clicks, they're pretty soft metrics, uh, open to interpretation. They don't necessarily mean that much. I think having that widely known is uh, is a positive thing for marketers, you know, actually needing to focus on on what matters. 
And I think it's also a really positive thing for consumers uh, because, you know, we, we do a lot of email. We like email. Um, and the more people trust email and trust that this stuff is not, you know, it's not tracking them, it's not monitoring their every move, that's good. Uh, people are going to use it more if they if they trust it. Yeah. Well, people have said email's dead, but uh, it's not. I mean, yeah. <laughs> I use email every day. Uh, it's, you know, it's it's a very we, reliable we start, medium. Yeah, exactly. We started Taguchi in 2008 and about 2012, we started to get worried about all this social media and, you know, everyone is trying to kill email and Google had Google Wave and that was going to kill email and then all these other things were going to come and kill email. And we, we got a bit worried at the time, just thinking, you know, is this a, is this a dying platform? Are we wasting our time here? But so, uh, yeah, I think right now I'm probably more optimistic about the future of email than I have been in a very long time, uh, particularly for kind of business to consumer communications. People, individual people aren't communicating via email that much anymore, but that's okay because the email email is kind of a, uh, you know, it's, it's the inbox for everything that you do with companies. Yeah. Um, all of your, your government stuff triggers emails off, your receipts, invoices, everything. They come to you through email and I, I really don't see that changing. Not for yeah. a while anyway. Yeah, and and obviously to be clear, I mean you also work with all the social media platforms. You can push messages out there as well, or are you only working on email? Uh, yeah, no. So so we can push messages to social media platforms. You know, we've got so we've just recently done a line integration uh, for a Japanese mm -hmm. uh, customer. So obviously that's um, that's huge there. And I guess the the interesting thing about uh, social media is it's it's an ever changing set of um, of companies. Uh, so, yeah, uh, we're sort of tracking that as as different brands rise and fall and uh, making sure we stay on top of that. There's also stuff uh, that we do around uh, pushing, uh, for example, audiences um, up to, to Facebook and Google for retargeting. So you can uh, you can hash email addresses, you know, just uh, obfuscate them so you're not exposing anyone's private information. Uh, and then you're able to retarget people on, on social media companies, sites as well. So, yeah. Now, just uh, another sort of a question without notice kind of thing. If a company comes to you and every company is different, everyone's marketing spend is different, everyone's products are yeah. different, but what is a rough estimate of how long it takes for a company to integrate with your system? What's the short version of the process that um, a company and your sales you know, and engineering people sort of come together to figure out what's going on, figure out what they want, what you can deliver and have a, a happy result? Yeah, it, that one is it's highly variable. Uh, it depends on the sophistication of uh, of a company's systems and what they need uh, to get up and running immediately. Because you sort of have this, uh, you know, what's the minimum viable level of service, and then where do we want to end up in the future? Um, I think we we tend to integrate a fair bit quicker than most players in this space. Uh, so even a really significant integration for us would tend not to take any more than a few months. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, we can you know we can have people up and running very quickly, yeah. a couple of days, and you know you can you can push data to us and you can send out email. Uh, so it, it, it yeah really does depend. Um, I think one of the positive things that we've seen in the last few years is companies really focusing on getting integrations up and running to start with, uh, rather than just you know having the customer database in an Excel file on a shared drive and uploading that each Friday to send out their weekly newsletter. Um, Companies are really understanding the value of doing that integration up front, uh, getting everything from their website, e-commerce platform, point of sale, all feeding in. And, and I guess, uh, yeah, with, with sort of the ongoing uh, challenges because of COVID, um, digital transformation is, uh, is really accelerating and we're seeing a lot more of, uh, of our customers integrating because of those sort of initiatives. So what sparked the idea for Taguchi's founders to create the company? You mentioned that uh, you've been in business since 2008 and, and how has that evolved since that time? Yeah, so uh, Spark, I, I think, would probably be, uh, be a nice way of putting it. It, it, it sort of grew out of uh, drudgery and, uh, and monotony. Um, so back pain, in points. pain points. Pain points, <laughs> exactly, exactly. Uh, specifically my pain points because uh, I was the one experiencing the pain. Uh, so back in 2008, uh, the world was, uh, you know, a pretty different place. Um, the the whole concept of 
individual one-to-one -one email uh, was actually not being widely used uh, and some companies were sort of playing around with it but most brands would they didn't really know how to use it they just thought oh yeah we should do something from uh, through email so they you know load up a million customers and just blast out the same email to them uh, without giving any part of the process much thought mm -hmm. uh, and still you know doing okay out of it because it was just so much cheaper than the alternative which was yeah loading up a database of a million postal addresses and printing off a million letters and mailing them. Uh, so it was it was kind of uh, very much in its infancy and we were working with uh, Webjet, which at the time was a uh, was a um, you know a relatively early stage startup. Mm -hmm. um, and the travel industry is is interesting because they have massive inventory. Just a huge number of different, you know, flights to from different places at different times, different fare classes, all the rest. So huge inventory, uh, significant customer base, and they're trying to email it, you know, every couple of days. And so they would give us these spreadsheets full of uh, full of flights, and we would have to load those into tables in emails and and send them out to the customer database, uh, which was a really manual process, really error prone. Uh, you know, having to, to constantly recode the email with all these different links and price points. And then, of course, they wanted to, to target it by, uh, by state because, you know, if you live in Melbourne, you don't care about flights from Sydney. Uh, so then that became, you know, probably about six times uh, the level of effort. Uh, and I was just spending my entire day uh, cutting up those, uh, those files and messing around with the spreadsheets. So over time, uh, we developed templates which would basically ingest the entire spreadsheet, sort all the flights out, um, you know, categorize them by origin, destination, et cetera, uh, and then generate fully formed HTML emails, which we could just upload straight into the email tool. Uh, so that, you know, my, uh, my effort involved in getting a single email out went from probably eight hours to about 20 minutes. Um, that would have been a great so day. <laughs> yeah, that was a pretty good investment of time. Um, mm. And I guess uh, that sort of kept on going from there. When that happens, and this is something that we see all the time, even today, when you take this manual process, it takes, you know, somebody a whole day to get out an email, and then you automate it, and they can do it in 20 minutes. Obviously, the person is still employed for the whole day. Uh, mm. So if, if their job is doing the email, that means they can produce a whole lot more. Mm. And if you can produce a whole lot more, then you can be much more segmented, much more targeted, because you've got all the content there. Uh, so yeah, you can you can start testing new things. You can start doing all of those things that they tell you to do when you're doing your marketing uh, degree, all of that split testing and, and everything else. You can actually execute on those uh, and still have time in the day for, for lunch and, and dinner and whatnot. So Taguchi, I guess, started off as, hey, this is taking too much work. There's a better way. Let's uh, let's automate, and then we sort of realise now that we've automated, we can be a lot smarter about what we're doing with the same overall effort. So we then got into the uh, the multivariate testing and real time optimization. Um, we pulled some uh, some techniques that were being used in direct mail, mm -hmm. and you know they're, they're decades old. Direct mail. If you talk to direct mail people. They are really, really smart about their testing and optimization, just because the the medium is so expensive. Uh, whereas email, it tends to be well, it costs you next to nothing, so just blast it out. Who cares? Uh, but we we were stealing those ideas from direct mail and and tweaking them uh, to work a bit better with uh, the particular problem space that email has, where you've got you know all these variations, you've got real time data coming in, you've got so much more data. How do you actually make decisions on the basis of it? So we were tweaking those algorithms to work better, um, ended up getting a patent uh, in the US and Australia for uh, multivariate uh, optimization in email. And our system uh, you know, ended up being capable of uh, sending out emails with, uh, with different variations of content, um, measuring the response uh, from customers uh, based on you know, those variations, and then in real time deciding which variations were doing better and sending more of those. Uh, so that's that's really powerful. It was, uh, when was this, 2009-ish. Um, you know, nobody was really doing that uh, in, a, in a sort of production sense. There, was, there were experiments, but it wasn't, uh, wasn't standard functionality anywhere. Yeah. 
Yeah, exactly. So, so we had this great idea and thought, yeah, this is the future. Everyone's going to be amazed and uh, and you know want to buy it. Uh, so we and they uh, were. We, you, well, you, um, did a couple <laughs> they of things. They the had US, to learn spoke, about it. Yeah, spoke to uh, you know email service providers, and they sort of said, yeah, that's really cool, mm. um, but you know our customers don't have the content. They don't have the staff the the industry isn't there basically um and so they they didn't really want to you know there, there was some interest but uh nobody they really said yes that's great we're gonna we're gonna deploy Apple this has. tomorrow yeah. yeah so we uh we sort of came back and and gave things a bit of a think and decided the best thing to do would be uh to start doing our own email distribution mm -hmm. um and obviously that's uh that's a, a bit of a thorny kind of issue because of spam con constraints and IP reputation and everything else. So we took a, a little while to sort of navigate uh, all of that, but we ended up with a system that was built from the ground up around the idea of one-to-one -one personalization. So, you know, every single email that Taguchi sends is always unique uh, and it's always got that full personalization, segmentation, targeting capability, even if customers aren't actually using it at the time. So yeah, our system is, you know, rather than being like a one to many distribution tool, like a, a lot of the uh, legacy email service providers were, it's always been a one to one personalized uh, system. And I think that's, you know, stood us in really good stead uh, since we were started because applications for this kind of one to one targeting just keep on coming up. Uh, and it, it's, it's very clear that, you know, systems like it, it, it now, nowadays, it's it's basically table stakes uh, in the email service provider world, um, but it, it's kind of been an awkward retrofit for for a lot of companies uh, trying to move away from this batch and blast as they uh, as they called it. Um, you know, here's a, a CSV file with a million email addresses. Here's an HTML file containing the content. Send that to all those addresses. Uh, it's it's a bit of a different process when you're doing a separate one for each individual person. You list some of Australia's most trusted brands on your homepage. So are there any customers uh, you'd like to highlight and any customer success stories you'd like to share? Yep. So we, uh, yeah, we're, we're pretty proud of our client base. Um, we think that uh, basically all of our clients get it. Uh, you know, they get the value of personalization. They get the value of automation. Uh, and uh, we've been kind of going along that, uh, that journey with all of them, um, you know, across a whole bunch of different industries. Um, Domino is obviously a really uh, good partner um, for us. Uh, we've done a couple of case studies with them on uh, on you know, email production and personalization. And I think one of the things that we, uh, we've we helped them do is really get down to that, you know, producing thousands and thousands of variations uh, on email uh, content, but still kind of keep it as a, as a broadcast. Um, so they have a very successful, very high volume email program. Uh, and I guess by enhancing that rather than replacing it completely, we're able to bring in more and more personalized content into just a, a regular daily email. Uh, so even though it kind of looks like a standard email that is the same for everyone, it's actually everything in it is actually personalized. Uh, and that personalization is, you know, based on individual buying behavior and it's based on uh, what Domino's uh, local franchisees want to sell in their local market as well. Uh, so, yeah, that's been, uh, I guess, a, a really good journey to, to go through um, with them. They're a thriving company and, and doing really, really good work uh, in this space, which you would think, you know, selling pizza, it's, it's not really kind of a, a very technical thing, but uh, they, they really get digital at a corporate level, uh, and they are executing very, very well in this space. So you mentioned COVID before. Everybody knows it's been a massive disruptor to everyday life and it's been a huge accelerator for digital interaction, transformation, outreach, and the cloud. So what were the lessons that Taguchi learned over the last two years of the pandemic? And you know, how did it change your products and services? How did the pandemic change marketing? Yeah. So for us, it's been, a, I guess, an interesting exercise. You know, we've got, uh, we've got systems in Los Angeles as well as Melbourne as well as uh, being hosted in uh, in AWS and Azure. So we've got kind of a hybrid uh, 
infrastructure environment and some of the travel restrictions have, have made uh, i guess servicing interesting but uh, it's sort of a, an exercise in ensuring that your uh, business re continuity plans disaster recovery plans are uh, all uh, all up to scratch and, and working that you've got the redundancy to cope with all of these changing uh, restrictions and rules around what you can and can't do where you can and can't go uh, we found uh, because uh, you know we're ISO 27001 certified we've we've had all of those plans for years uh, the actual transition to remote work for us was was pretty straightforward um, it's you know been interesting navigating the dynamics of taking on new staff during this period and kind of kind of trying to induct people into the culture of the company when you've only even met them once to hand over their laptop and that's it uh, but yeah I, I think we've we've been able to navigate that okay from a technological perspective i i don't think we've actually had to make that many changes uh to us it's sort of been a um almost like a, a moment of vindication uh in that the, all of this uh, this stuff that we've been preaching about for, for years and years, um, digital transformation, automation, uh, that kind of digital mindset, um, everyone is getting it now. Mm. And uh, yeah, so so I think it's kind of been in, in some ways a, a positive moment for us. Uh, but on the other hand, it's also been, I guess, personally pretty difficult. <laughs> um, and, and for a lot of our clients, um, you know, particularly travel and hospitality, it's been uh, it's been a struggle. Um, luckily, I guess the the you know the brands that we're partnered with are, are pretty strong, um, and they've been able to you know use the time to make uh, some positive changes, um, improve efficiency, all the rest. So I think as things come back, they're going to be really really well placed uh, for the future. But yeah, it's uh, it's been a really interesting time, and I think probably more more as observers of change than necessarily going through an enormous amount of change ourselves. So to change gears for a moment, as we get towards the end of the interview, I always like to ask, what is a memory you can share of your first computer? First computer? Oh, yeah, I, I could talk about this topic for hours. <laughs> um, so my first computer, my parents bought a Mac Plus. Uh, when I was one year old, um, yeah, which you know they were brand new at the time, so a bit of a giveaway of my age there. But uh, yeah, so Mac Plus. Um, I've, last time I checked, I had some saved Mac Paint files from 1987, um, and uh, you know some of my relatively early childhood memories are playing various games on on the Mac Plus. Um, so that was uh, probably uh, I guess a formative experience for me. Um, it's interesting though they they kept it for about 10 years so what started off as a really revolutionary computer at the time was incredibly dated um you know almost uh, almost dinosaur age thing by the time they bought a new one mm. um which yeah is you know obviously having lived through it yourself the uh the pace of technological change in computing from 1987 through to 1997 was astounding mm. Whereas these Absolutely. days, if you, if you take a computer from, like if you take a MacBook from 2011, put it next to a MacBook from today, yeah, there are some differences. Not uh, not exactly groundbreaking in a lot of ways. Well, the, M the M1 chip is pretty amazing. The, M but the, M1 I mean, is, yeah. <laughs> the M1, I've probably been more excited about that than just about anything uh, else yeah. that's happened to computing in the last 10 years. So I, I, I love that my, I'm using a MacBook Air right now, and I yeah. love that zoom and teams do not cause the fan to spin because there is no fan <laughs> yeah yeah the, the only fan yeah. that this uh, uh macbook Air has to worry about is the fan that's sitting right in front of it because <laughs> yeah. i'm such a big yeah. fan of, of the mac yeah oh, they're, they're great they're great mm. and uh i'm i'm looking forward to you know once the uh once the six inch m1 macbook pros are in stock uh, yeah. getting a couple of those in the company because they look like great machines as well they are they're fabulous. It's uh, uh, nice. really cool, uh, really cool. And uh, yeah, yeah you, you, you're going to love it. Uh, let's just leave it at that. But you're going to absolutely love yeah. it. They're amazing machines. And even Reddit came out uh, with a blog post explaining the value uh, of time, you know, that they're, it costs for their developers and the amount of time this saves. They were talking about exporting some sort of Android app, you know, basically rendering yeah. it so that it, it, is, it has been... Um, uh, completed and it is yep. taking 45 minutes or something and it's taking less than half that on a macbook m1 yeah. 
so wow. or with Pro or Mac. So it's just a big time saver, and they say it's just worth giving everybody that is doing development one of these MacBook Pros because they get all, a lot of time back. Yeah. It's like it's like the eight hours it took you to do the data entry yeah, down to exactly. twenty minutes, exactly. <laughs> same yeah. sort of thing. Yep. Yeah, and and that's that's you know really what technology should be. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, I've been a Mac user my whole life, so it's been uh, been interesting seeing Apple uh, change over the years. Yeah, absolutely. Now, Ben, what is a short version of your own history in the world of tech that has led you mm. to becoming the technical director and chief systems ar- uh, architect? And what is a typical day in the life of a chief systems architect and technical director. Are there any typical days? I'll, I'll have to think about that one, but I'll answer the first part of the question first. Oh, sure. um, so, yeah, I guess having started on the Mac pretty early on, uh, I, I've always been interested in, in computing, um, got into HyperCard stack development at an early age. HyperCard is a great program that kind of tied People together. People still miss it today. Yeah, yeah People yeah, still absolutely. For it, yeah. Tied, tied together you know, graphics and code and database-like stuff as well. Really, really cool. Um, And yeah, so so I guess that was probably my intro into the whole thing, scripting these little stacks and, you know, making little interactive games and that kind of stuff. Um, Moved up to to C and uh, and that sort of thing um, for a while. Uh, Then... I guess finishing high school, starting uni around the time that uh, well, probably just before Web two, you know, the the Web two mindset was was taking off with with AJAX and JavaScript that was actually usable in the browser and and that kind of stuff. I I got into that, um, dabbled in some PHP and Ruby and Python and and everything else. And uh, I guess yeah, my my first job uh, was working on a team that uh, managed an SMS gateway uh, for three back in the day um and so we we were kind of doing this digital messaging type stuff you know real time uh, with a fairly high degree of automation as well Mm. um and the the digital agency that i was working for then sort of started moving into email um and and we uh we picked up webjet as a client who were just starting an email marketing program uh, and that's sort of where where that uh, impetus to develop the thing that became Taguchi came from. Uh, so yeah, I, I guess I, um, you know, it probably hasn't been a strategic series of job shifts for me. It's been much more of an organic process of, well, here I've learned this, uh, how else can I apply it? And you just keep on tacking on, you know, other things that you've learned and, and applying them in, in new ways. Um, so yeah, it's it's sort of an, been a very organic process for me, but uh, I, I think it's been a pretty good one um second part of the question was well it was it was about I, yeah what do you what's the typical day in the life for you and, and and you know what are some of the advances that you've been able to pioneer to get you that might give us an insight into a typical day for you <laughs> so uh, so a typical day um for me it's changed a lot over the years um mm. you know starting out to gucci was uh as uh, my co-founder dean um me and one employee uh, and so we were we were all really cross-functional. Um, I am becoming less and less cross-functional as time goes on. Um, you know, mostly it's my team doing stuff, writing code. I write nowhere near as much code as I would like these days. But uh, it's um, yeah, you know, when that's you have, why you uh, have that's why you have employees in a team. And uh, yeah, exactly. You know? When you have other people doing that sort of stuff, it's the things that the parts of your role that make sense are the ones that you can articulate to somebody and, and give away. So you're just kind of left with the weird ones that don't necessarily make much external sense. Uh, so yeah, I'm I'm uh, it, it's a combination of everything for me, I guess. Um, I, I would spend a fair bit of time, you know, making sure that we're on top of all of our service metrics. Um, so we have SLAs with all of our clients, and those things need to be maintained. So uh, you know, keeping uh, abreast of any issues that might crop up, um, checking in with uh, with our research and development team uh, on new functionality. Uh, we've got a really good uh, project manager now, which has been great because uh, that was previously, uh, I guess, part of uh, part of my role, and it's it's really hard to kind of come up with you know from a user perspective what are all the things we need to add over time and then mm. actually get into coding them and then worry about the infrastructure that those things run on. Uh, so 
it's been really good to to be able to give her um, ownership of of that product and and our new features, and she's able to keep much more I guess in touch with uh, with all of our clients, um, and and be more strategic about the functionality that we add. So so that's been really good. Uh, but you know I'm I'm checking in on on that sort of thing each day. Um, then a lot of it is, is kind of unblocking team members. Um, so, you know, everyone's everyone's doing their jobs, but uh, people... People can get stuck. You know, people, yeah, exactly. You get, you get stuck and they just need a bit of knowledge that they haven't been exposed to in their role. And I guess because I've, I've sort of been there since the very outset, um, I'm often reasonably well-placed to at least have an idea where they can look uh, to find the answer. So uh, there's uh, there's a lot of that as well. So, yeah, it's, it's bits and pieces. And then just trying to keep on top of... Uh, of our changing, uh, our changing industry, and you know what's going to, what's the current big thing? What's the next big thing going to be? And where are the threats and opportunities in that? Yeah. Now I, I know that uh, in the movie House of Gucci we have Lady Gaga, and uh, we have Adam Driver, and maybe Adam Driver can play you in the upcoming House of Taguchi <laughs> movie. But it made me think: where does the movie, where does the name Taguchi come from? Sounds Japanese. Yeah, so- so yes, yes, it is Japanese. Um, we uh, it was interesting. We were in these uh, early meetings with the uh, with the Japanese client that we have, and uh, I think they were a bit disappointed when it turned out that actually no, we're we're not uh, we're not Japanese at all. Um, <laughs> we do now have somebody who speaks Japanese, but we're we're not a Japanese company. So Genichi Taguchi was a, a Japanese engineer in the post World War Two period, um, and he uh, worked with the Japanese auto industry, which was at that time undergoing some enormous uh, change in, in sort of process and, and scale as well. Um, and Kenichi Taguchi uh, developed, I guess, methodologies around continuous improvement uh, and testing that enabled the Japanese auto industry to really become uh, the, the sort of uh, the juggernaut that they are today. Uh, and that's a lot of that is based on their, their process control and manufacturing techniques and philosophies around continuously refining uh, tolerances and you know material specifications and everything else to make the absolute most reliable product they can uh, at mm. whatever price point. So um, yeah, he- You were inspired by that name. We, we were inspired by the name. Uh, a lot of people think because there is a Taguchi method, uh, which is, um, you know, often used or sometimes used in in marketing uh, for uh, multivariate optimization based on limited sample sizes. Uh, so it's something that you know you occasionally come across in direct mail. Uh, we don't actually use his method, uh, but it's the philosophy, I guess, the principle of continuous improvement and optimization yeah. uh, that inspires us as a company, and that's kind of where. Yeah, like what I was what I was saying before. That's really where we uh, where we see ourselves adding the most value. Yeah, he was. I mean, we all talk about digital transformations today, but he was doing manufacturing transformations, strategic yeah. transformation. He was doing all that uh, decades ago. So yeah, absolutely, yeah. Yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Now, how do you think the marketing automation uh, industry will evolve, and how do you think Taguchi will evolve over the next couple of years, and where do you think it'll be in the twenty thirties? I mean, do we already live in the a minority report world, or is that still to come? Yeah, I uh, I, I really think we do uh, in a lot of ways. It's it's not necessarily um, recognised by the public as widely as it could be. But when you look at the sort of data sets that companies are collecting now, it's uh, yeah, minority report. If anything was uh, undersold, the uh, the amount of targeting <laughs> tracking that's going to yeah. exist, or that sorry that already exists, let alone that will exist in twenty thirty. Mm-hmm. Um, I think I'm not seeing any kind of major step changes, I guess, in where we're headed. I mean, people rarely do see those sort of step changes, but I, I think the acceleration of, of current trends is probably going to be disruptive enough. Um, there's this idea that you know software is eating the world, and I think digital distribution really is, is eating the world. Um, a lot of the things that we see as traditional media, uh, so you know, traditional, uh, say, billboards in the streets, um, TV, radio, etc. A lot of those are going to be kind of subsumed by uh, true digital equivalents of the same channels. Uh, so obviously, you know, in billboards, we've we've got uh, digital billboards which are going to become smarter and smarter. Um, the ones at bus stops, you know, 
if it detects that your phone's nearby, that there's somebody there, it can display a different thing. If there's a way of tracking uh, you, you know, based on based on some sort of identifier, then it can display something targeted to you. Yeah, I, uh, mean, I remember seeing something a couple of years ago where a uh, one of those digital billboards had broken down, you know, sitting in the in the middle of the street and in, in some sort of um, city square, and it was the back there was the back end that that was on, and as people were walking up to it, their faces were being you know, inside of the green squares that were basically doing facial recognition, so they could tell if you had seen the ad yeah. before, and in the, yeah. so they're already doing that. <laughs> That's yeah. the Minari Report type of thing. Yeah, exactly. Um, so yeah, it's and and you know it's not just faces; it, it's uh, it's your, your phone. It's um, the Chinese government's done a bunch of work on gate recognition. So even if you've got a mask on, yeah. uh, that it can work out who you are based on your walk, uh, which is apparently, you know, distinctive. Um, so yeah, the the number of ways that you can track people is is enormous, uh, and I think that's gonna that's gonna get used in more uh, more and more. The other one. I think we're going to see things like the traditional video and, and radio, or sorry, traditional TV and radio, um, sort of get subsumed by by Spotify, uh, that kind of always on streaming service, uh, and obviously Spotify does you know ads right now, uh, but there's an enormous amount of potential in terms of targeting personalised ads there. Um, also, all the streaming services, uh, I you know I hate saying this because I don't want want to make it come true, but I think it's going to come true. They're all going to start doing ads, just like cable TV started as the premium no ad product and then, you know, put as many ads as, in as, as free to air just about. So I, I would see, you know, ads cropping up in, in Netflix and, and everything else. Uh, and when you think about the amount of data they have and the potential for integration through custom audience type functionality as well, I think probably there's massive scope uh, for targeted video advertising. Uh, and not just, you know, working out, okay, you like cars, so we'll show you a car ad. But even programmatic kind of re-editing of pre-recorded video content. So it goes, okay, well, you've got kids on your Netflix account, so we'll we'll assume you're a family. We're going to show you this car ad, uh, but all the interior stuff is going to be a family rather than a, a single person or a couple or whatever. Uh, so I think, I think we're going to see a lot of that and stuff that is so finely targeted that and then uh, seamlessly targeted that people don't even realize you know right now we're i think in the infancy of um of that kind of omnipresent targeting and you sort of notice these creepy uh I mean, you searched a washing machine on amazon and now all you see as you go around the internet is, is ads for washing machines uh, which is you know really brain dead kind of stuff but uh, can, and can be annoying once you've made the purchase Oh, and they're still advertising it to you. But we've also yeah. heard of where Facebook knew somebody's daughter or some you know someone yeah. was pregnant before before they did. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So so we're gonna, I think we're gonna see that become a lot more sophisticated. And I think essentially the sort of targeting that you can currently do in in email or on websites that is going to be omnipresent uh, across you know pure digital channels, but also this sort of hybrid digital real world uh, channels that we have in you know digital billboards or displays in shopping centers all that kind of stuff and let's not forget the augmented reality glasses that are uh, well, coming yeah, I mean, this year i mean coming this decade kind of changer. and yeah. and you know then you've got well the the augmented reality glasses can detect that you're looking at an ad so i can block it out or replace it with a new ad yeah <laughs> like, <laughs> ad blockers on steroids yeah, ad hijackers, yeah. ad hijackers. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Crazy I mean, it, stuff, yeah. it, it, it's really interesting um, seeing the sort of potential that uh, that some of these technologies have. But I, I think you know that that's why I say it's probably more of a continuation of the same thing. It's a continuation of the trend for these uh, personalization technologies and capabilities that we think of as being digital native capabilities. Are just extending to everything. So, look, my second last question uh, is to simply ask you: What is the best piece of advice you've ever received to help you get where you are today? Yeah, uh, geez, it's a it's a tough one uh, narrowing it down. And you know, I, I don't necessarily have a great memory for quotes, so uh, I probably won't be able to sum it up in a you know in a really pithy kind of way. But uh, we'll give it a go anyway. Um, I, I think for me, it's the idea that you have to be, you have to be clear on your objectives, and it sounds really simple, um, but 
you you sort of can't get anywhere unless you know where you're trying to get. Um, and you see so many cases where sight of the objectives has been lost and you know there's there's a whole lot of floundering going on there. So being clear on the objectives, once you're clear on the objectives, you have a plan to to achieve that. Um, and then just taking, you know, setting up a process where you just take a step, however small, in line with that plan. Uh, and one quote I can remember uh, is that uh, plans are useless, but planning is indispensable. Um, that's uh, I think that's a really good one because it, it's not, you know, you always also see people getting uh, kind of set on specific plans that they've made and, and not realizing that that needs to change. Mm. And uh, I think, you know, the 99% of the value of having a plan is the process that went into creating that plan. Uh, no, no plan survives contact with reality for very long. So you're going to have to continuously reevaluate that. But, but just having the plan, going through that process of planning and setting up a process where you're just taking some small step, at least each day in accordance with that, um, yeah, is is really important because uh, you know if you're focusing on on those goals that you set, you, you need to have objectives and goals. But if you're focused on that, you're sort of emphasising the gulf between where you are now and where you're trying to get to. Whereas if you focus on the plan and whatever small steps you can take each day, uh, you'll you know you, you get there or at least you get closer uh, before you know it. Yeah, well, they talk about if you fail to plan, you plan to fail. Uh, mm. I think it might have been Yogi Berra or somebody who says words to the effect that if you don't know where you're going, you'll get there. <laughs> yeah. He always said those yeah. funny quotes. Well, exactly. And and you know, that, eating the elephant good. one bite so, at a time. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. I mean, so so I, I guess that's that's for me. That's been uh, been fairly true in my career to date. It's there hasn't been a uh, a yeah, I've had goals, but it's been sort of an iterative process and you kind of try something. If that's working for you, great, keep on doing it. If it's not working, you reevaluate, replan. Um, yeah, do what's necessary and it, it all seems to go along organically, I guess. So what's your final message for ITY viewers and readers and for your current and future customers and partners? Um, thanks for listening. Um, hope it was in some way helpful. Uh, if, you're, if you're interested, if you're... If, you disagree if you agree if you think any of it uh would be relevant to, to your company or where you're at then uh, please do get in touch um i, I one of the things i like most uh, about the role i have is you know being able to solve problems uh, so being able to solve my problems but being able to solve other pre people's problems as well uh, and i think that's something that we uh you know everyone at Taguchi has this uh this positive mindset towards you know, actually solving problems and and overcoming challenges and so that, that's something I really like doing. Um, and obviously, with all the changes that are happening in the last couple of years, it's uh, I think we're sort of at an inflection point uh, in, in history. Um, huge, you know, enormous changes across a whole number of different industries. Uh, and I think it's really important, you know, while these changes are occurring to be open-minded and I guess exploratory in, in you know, how you approach things. Uh, and yeah, trying trying new things, uh, getting exposed to new ideas. So I'd, I'd really enjoy uh, a conversation with uh, any readers that are interested. Yeah. Well, Ben Dyer, co-founder, technical director, and chief systems architect of Taguchi Marketing. Thank you very much for your time. I wish you the best of success, and I hope we can talk again in the future. Thank you very much, Alex. Thank you. Bye-bye.